Wabash Carnegie Library Oral History Program, April 5th, 1972. So, how long were you a uh, policeman in Wabash? A police officer? Well, now, you want to go for the sheriff, too, or just the police? Let's go for the sheriff, too. Well, Summerlin appointed me assistant, no, a special chief of police in October the 1st, 1925. I served three months. Jim Smallwood was elected sheriff and he was Hoyt's deputy and, and uh, Jim was uh, crying sales, so Jim appointed me first deputy sheriff, see, when he took office. But Jim hired, uh, had me to move to town and hired me to work when he had sales, see, for three months there. Jim Smallwood appointed on January the 1st, 1926, Jim Smallwood, Sheriff of Wabash County, appointed me first deputy sheriff, served four years. January the 1st, 1930, I was Sheriff of Wabash County for one term, two years. Mr. Roosevelt beat me out of the other term. <laughs> <laughs> now explain that to us. We, now, now we know that uh, the Sheriff has a uh, four-year term. Yeah. Now you say yours was a two-year term. We had two-year term. And uh, you lost that because of Roosevelt. Why? What, ha what happened to those two years? was Democratic. I was Republican. <laughs> In other words, uh, you went out on his coattails. Yeah. Every, every officer in, the, uh, in Wabash County was uh, Democratic except the, the treasurer and the uh, and the recorder. Well, now you were you were sheriff for two years or four years? Two years. Two years. Just no, one year. One year. That yeah, two years. That would be one term. But now it's now it's a four-year term. Yeah, no, was, was it a two-year term then? Yeah. Okay. Now what do you want? Um, let's work backwards for a moment now. Um, I can give you the. Uh, the police record here now, if you want. Well, all right, yeah, let's let's take that now. Go ahead. Well, I served two years, so on January the 20th, 1932, Homer T. Showalter, mayor of Wabash County, appointed me as patrolman, served three years, and worked nights for the three years. January the 1st, 1936, Jim Smallwood, mayor of, Wabash, uh, mayor of Wabash, appointed me assistant chief of police, served eight years, work nights. January the 1st, 1945, Homer T. Showalter, mayor of Wabash County, appointed me assistant chief of police, served five years, worked nights. Now that five-year term, he got an extra year in there. The, the uh, regular term was four years, but he got an extra some way through the law to make it come out in a certain time. Even up the election, perhaps. Yeah. Right. In January the 1st, 1948, Edward Timmons, mayor of Wabash, appointed me assistant chief of police, served three years, worked nights. January the 1st, 1951, Edward Timmons appointed me chief of police, served one year, worked days. January the 1st, 1952, James L. Smallwood, mayor of Wabash, appointed me chief of police served four years. Resigned January the 20th, 1956, went on pension. That's 24 years. 24 years of law enforcement. Well, 30 years. 30. Six years mm -hmm. in the sheriff's Six. office and, and 24 in the police department. All right. 
What had you done prior to that? What, what sort of work did you do before uh, you went to the sheriff's department? You don't want to go clear back to when I was a kid, do you? I was, I was a farmer and when I came to Wabash in uh, 1925, I was a farmer. I lived in Chester Township. And before that, I worked with my dad on the farm. And I worked with uh, L.B. Colors and the other guy. And his partner had three thrash machines. Each one of them run one outfit and I run the other one for about six or eight years. Did you travel with those? Well, just, just thrashed here. Locally? In, yeah, here mm -hmm. in Wabash County. Mm -hmm. Custom farming? Yeah. yeah. Well, that, I haven't got that wrote down, but I remember that. Okay. Your uh, first few months there as uh, uh, deputy sheriff, are you, uh, you didn't move to Wabash then? Yeah, moved to Wabash in October. And where did you live at that time? Here in Wabash? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Well, do you know where Molly Logan used to, don't suppose you do, Molly Logan used to live up on East Maple Street? Was, let's see, it was between, what's the hospital on? East Street. East, east and the next one is, next one west is what? Spring. Spring. Well, mm -hmm. I lived in, in the middle of that block. Mm -hmm. Did you furnish your own car when you were uh, deputy sheriff? That's right. That was part of the routine in those days, wasn't it? Yeah. Where you paid mileage for the uh, uh, for the distances you drove? Well, the sheriff was. I got uh, see how was that pay? I got so much a month of being. Uh, Riding bailiff, mm -hmm. that's for the court. And then when the court wasn't in session, Smallwood paid me a salary. Were you the only deputy at that time? Yeah. That's right. But uh, you had to be not only deputy sheriff then, but you also had court duties. Oh, yeah, that's what the... You see, it takes three, three officers to make a court. It takes the judge, the, the clerk, and the sheriff. I have a court. When you were uh, uh, deputy sheriff, uh, you not only had to furnish your own car, how about equipment? Did you have to furnish your own equipment or did the county buy? Uh, oh, I furnished everything. Uh, no uniforms in those days? No. All we had was a mace and a rifle, uh, pistol. Sheriff had shotguns and rifles. No. Did you have a radio in your car then? No. I'm interested. How would you uh, how would you handle a call in those days uh, without radio contact with, uh, well, with they, the sheriff's office? They'd call the sheriff's office and tell us where they live, and we'd go to that address. And then, if you needed additional information or if you needed I'd help, you'd home. have to get the telephone or drive back in, wouldn't you? Yeah. Come back to the to the sheriff's office, and then uh, after the sheriff, of course, they'd call the jail. Mm -hmm. And then the, my wife, of course, she was the matron. What do you call them? Matron? Matron? Mm -hmm. Matron. Was there any such thing as a typical day when you were deputy sheriff? What, what would your duties involve on an average day, if you could recall? Oh, that's hard to guess. Any any riots or any calls come in where they wanted the sheriff, you'd go and answer them. Back in them days, was uh, in prohibition. And you had quite a few liquor cases to look after. Moonshine. Mm -hmm. Did you ever find any stills in Wabash County? Yes. What would you do with them? Well, bring them in and have trials for the uh, people, and the court would advise us what to do with the stills. 
-hmm. They were usually destroyed, were they? Oh, yeah, all of them. What would you do with the moonshine? Well, same thing. You're supposed to destroy it after you had you had to keep it for evidence until after the trial was over. You'd hold that and label it as, as evidence. Yeah. Any of those stills particularly well hidden? You remember any uh, episodes where you... Uh, no. Not well hidden, no. Yeah. no wait, I don't believe. While I was deputy sheriff, I don't think we, we got a still. We got... Uh, Quite a bit of home brew. Uh -huh. <laughs> Did people make an effort to hide it? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. What did they do? Keep it in their cellar or? Uh, oh, any place. How were you tipped off to this? Well, what, what would be the different routine? ways? No, I don't. I don't want any names mentioned here because there's some of these people living here now. What I'm saying is on this record, ain't it? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Shut it off a minute. Well, here's what we do. Let's put it on, then we give you a type copy, and you just scratch it any way you want to. Nobody will see it until you get the type copy, and then you scratch it any way you want to. Well, you fellows are both young. I don't suppose you ever knew Alice Shuey, did you? Ever hear of her? No, sir. Dingman? No. Well, this is just an example of what we... They live, you know... Uh, Spikerville out north of town on 13. The first house south of Spikerville on the west side of the road was where Al Shuey is living at this time, her and her husband. And he was bootleg. And she was getting kind of tired of him. So she had a daughter and a son. So she had the daughter to come turn them in, turn what you name in, see. So that's when the sheriff, he was sheriff and I was deputy at that time. So he and Charlie Boldy and myself went out there. And they weren't home. So they had a double corn crib out there. Door through here and we just drove in here and waited for them to come home. So after a bit they drove home and we uh, got out of the car and went up, read the search warrant to him, searched around. And I went upstairs. And we wouldn't have any luck finding any of this stuff. And I went upstairs to look around and she followed me over the stairway. There's a closed stairway in the door there and I started up and she says, it's under the back porch, it's under the back steps in the porch. <laughs> I went on upstairs and looked around, come down, couldn't find anything. Charlie, that's Boldy, was watching him, see, and Smallwood and me was doing all the searching. So I come down and I said, motion for Jim to come out. I said, uh, Alice told me that it was under the back steps, and there was three steps like in there, the back door. Wooden steps. Mm -hmm. So I went back there, and we just rolled that over and had a hole down there, and there was a <laughs> like, beer home, brew beer there, see. And Boldy's watching him, and I said to Jim, I said, hey, Jim, come here. He looked at it. I said, here's your home brew. And out went Dingman, that's Alice's husband, out the door, right at fast boat, didn't run out in the cornfield. So Jim, I took after him out in the town of the cornfield. He was, it was raining that day, too, and it was muddy. And he went into the cornfield, and all oh, the corn was up high in my head. And I tracked him through the cornfield, and Jim got in the car and drove around, and on the other side of the cornfield, and he come right out in front of Jim. <laughs> and there stood Bully back there. Well, when I come back, well, Alice said to me, he says, your car's sitting on some out there in the corn crib. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, the floor was up about this high off of the, off the ground, you see, and that board floor in there. 
so we drove the car up, and there was a couple of loose boards, and it probably doesn't come up, and there was a whole gob of home brew in, under them boards in there. <laughs> we hadn't searched that out there, to see. She was tired of him. She's trying to get him rid of him, and he got penal farm sentence out of that. So here was an example of somebody who was uh, turned in because of a grudge. Oh, yeah. yeah. Would that have been a common uh, occurrence oh, to yeah. people blow the whistle on yeah. somebody else because of a, of yeah, a grudge? One, one jealous bootlegger after another. Mm -hmm. Put the knife into the other one that yeah. way. Get rid of it. Yeah. And the only still that I remember of, me yeah. having any uh, work on, was after I was sheriff. And uh, Freddie Ackerman, you knew him. Yes, sir. His father owned a little farm out by Belden Bridge out in there, someplace. And he rented it to somebody out there. Somebody told us that he's still going out there. So I got a search warrant for the place, three or four other officers. We went out there, pulled in the yard, and this fellow, I, I don't remember his name, we went up, and they was inside playing the radio, I guess it was, in there. This house was empty, only he had that one room had a bed in it downstairs, and then he had his still upstairs. And they was, he and a young kid were sitting there on his bed playing some kind of cards. And we searched the place, went upstairs, and he had two barrel of mash going up there, and had still running. We got a five gallon can of moonshine. So we emptied the barrels and brought everything in to court. He got a sentence out of it. I don't remember what, what it was anymore, but he got a sentence out of it. Any uh, particular incident uh, that made you decide to run for sheriff after your term as deputy? <coughs> Oh, not only that I've been doing the, what you call, uh, on something like that, be the dirty work for the sheriff, you know. You know what an assistant is. <laughs> and uh, I just thought maybe I'd like to have that job paid more money, of course. So I ran, and there was only there's only 15 on the Republican ticket to run for sheriff that time. 13 on Democrat ticket. <laughs> a popular job then. Yeah. Well, why was the job so popular? Because of, of the... I uh, don't know. It was come along one time. It was kind of hard. Mm -hmm. Jobs looked very good, and that was a pretty big, good paying job at that time. Do you, do you remember some, who uh, some of the uh, Republicans were who ran against you in the primary? Oh, yes. Vera Howell, you knew him. Harry Ridgway, you knew him. Walter Guy, you knew him. Oh, I've forgotten now who all they were. Yeah, I know he was 15. Uh, Bill, Bill, Bill. He's kind of a character around town. He ran, he, he only got about 100 or 100 and five or six votes. Walter Guy got less than a hundred. Now Walter later came on the police department. He was, he was on, wait a minute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Harry Ridgeway at one time was fire chief, and wasn't he also police uh, he, chief at one he time? He was police chief. He was on this, uh, he was chief of police when we went and made this uh, still raid out. Mm -hmm. uh, he went with me on that. Who was your opponent in the fall election, then? Who won for the uh, Democrats in the primary? Harv Shoemaker. 
he was on the police department. Do you remember what your uh, victory margin was? No. Okay. It was a bit over 100, and that's a pretty good average, or a pretty good margin after 15. Mm -hmm. I like the Democrats running for president now. <laughs> <laughs> Last night in Wisconsin. Yeah. yeah. Who was your uh, deputy sheriff then? Mickey Stevenson. Did he uh, stay the four years with you? I wouldn't know. Or, uh, pardon me, the two years. two years. Did he stay the two years with you? Yeah, and then he was elected sheriff later on after that. Our shoemaker was in there four years, and then Mickey was mm -hmm. the next sheriff after Harv. He beat. Uh, who run again? Harv. I think Harv died. And then uh, you moved down into the jail when you were yeah, I moved, sure. I moved into jail in, uh, before school started, when school started, September, don't mm -hmm. it? Yes, sir. Well, Mrs. Smallwood didn't like to live there, so uh, I moved down there so I wouldn't, my oldest girl was going to school and wouldn't have to change schools. So I lived there from September until uh, for two years and then I moved out in December. I moved here in just before Christmas in December. In this house now at, yeah. at uh, 210 Falls Avenue. Yeah. How'd your wife like living in the jail? Oh, okay. just like any woman would. <laughs> they ain't got no privacy. No. Now it's worse. They've got the sheriff's office over there. There ain't no sheriff's office in the Gord House anymore. But uh, when, when you were a sheriff, you still had the uh, sheriff's office in the courthouse? Yeah, and, then, and of course we had the office in the jail, yeah. but that is the jail office. Now, did you have to run the jail by yourself? You ha did you have a turnkey? No. You ran it yourself? Yeah. Um, your wife cooked the meals then for the prisoners and yeah. uh, served the meals. And, uh, That's right. She had to act as, as a matron then with uh, women prisoners, I, yeah. I would imagine. You walk up very many women in those days. Well, no, not too many. You get one once in a while. Has the jail uh, changed much since uh, since you were sheriff? It's, uh, it's an old building. Yeah, the jail itself. Now I haven't been in it for quite a spell. You see, I've been retired now from the police department. Uh, I, I retired in '56. Uh, mm -hmm. This is '72. It'd be 16 years. But up through 56, it hadn't changed very much yeah. then since you were, since you were there. Um, now, as sheriff, you uh, you had not only law enforcement duties, but uh, you had uh, court papers to serve. Yeah, yeah, and, that's, uh, and that's the main thing. Uh, we didn't have so much uh, uh, police work as they've got now that uh, we didn't answer too many calls. Mm -hmm. But uh, now, see, they've got, what, four deputies? I think so. And the sheriff. Mm -hmm. What would have been your most uh, frequent call in, in the line of police work when you were sheriff? Oh, family trouble, mm -hmm. I suppose. And would that, uh, would that have constituted the biggest problem to you? Well, I'll say this, you don't know, you go out and hear both sides, one will come in and tell you one thing, and the other will tell you something else, and you can't take sides. You ever feel that you were more of a referee than a sheriff? Yeah. Okay. Same thing happened in the police department, too. How about uh, traffic duties and traffic detail in those days? We didn't have too much of that. Yeah, they have now, got lots of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, auto accidents uh, a problem to the uh, sheriff's department then? Well, some, yeah, but not near so many as it is now. Mm -hmm. Any uh, uh, particular incidents that stand out during your uh, term as sheriff? What do, you, what do you recall when you think back on those days? Well, I've got a lot of them. <laughs> Let us have a couple. We had to handle insane patients course. One time 
I got a call from Manchester. I'm not going to mention any names there. That a doctor had gone out to a house out in the country, out of Manchester, and the woman was supposed to be sick. She ran him out of the house with a butcher knife. <coughs> so he would go back to Manchester and called the marshal, and the marshal called me. And uh, I got Harry Ridgeway, Bill Ply. You remember Bill Ply? He was door shaker. I believe I do. Yes, sir. He was. He went along and went to Manchester and picked up the marshal Earl Heater there. We went out to this place, and here's the road and here's the house. There wasn't any yard yard fence here. So I drove in here. I just drove up in the yard here in the summertime. The yard was solid. And she came out on the porch. And there was a porch clear along the front end of the house here. There was a door here and a door here. There's two doors into the house there. And we started to get out of the car and her husband was in the back, back in the barn lot. And he just stayed back there. He didn't come out at all. And she come out on this porch and had this butcher knife about like that in her hand, up like this. And she began to cuss us driving in on the yard. And we just split out. My car is sitting here and some of us got off here and some here and some up went up here. We scattered out there. One of us would start up towards the porch. She'd come to that end of the porch. And he'd back up and the other end go up there. She'd, she'd go that way, in the same way here in front. Well, I'm over here, of course. <laughs> and I start up and she started towards me, swinging that butcher knife. And I just back up and I think Harry Ridgeway went up towards the porch there and got up pretty close. And she hurried over there and when she turned around, I jumped on her back. <laughs> She had this knife going this way. I pinned her on back this way and put my knee in her back. Well, that could have been bad, see. That long wooden knife. Nobody but, was cut. No, uh, well, Ridgeway, he, he come up there then and and uh, he hadn't had too much experience with the law enforcement officers at that time. And he just tried to wrench that knife out of his out of her hand and she cut him a little, not not very bad, but she, she knifed him a little. You see, when you got a knife in your hand there, you break your wrist that way, that knife, your hand will open up. Instead of that, he tried to pull her fingers apart to get that knife out, and she jerked right back to her, to his hand. <laughs> These tricks to all trades. I know? guess so. <laughs> what else do you remember from, uh, from those uh, years as sheriff? Well, when we when I was deputy, we got a call from Manchester. There was a man over there driving a truck. They claimed he was crazy, and he had been in the asylum a time or two before. So Smallwood and me went over there. <laughs> we got over there and we seen him. Mark was and two or three men was watching him. We hey, we've got a new sight of tape here. You were just at the point where the uh, where you arrived there, and the uh, the other men were, were watching the fellow in the uh, truck. Well, we got got told to him, wanted him to come over to Wabash to see a fellow over here, sell him some seed corn. He said, "Well, you can go." He said, "Well, come over and get in the car." We thought everything was going fine. Oh no, he said, I was just driving the truck over. And then I was way to get back. We told him we'd bring him back. No, I won't go unless you let me drive the truck over. So he'd been driving all over Manchester. We'd watched him. He'd driving pretty good. Wasn't having any trouble, didn't have no accident or anything. So big me, I said small and I said, well, you get a couple of three fellas in the car and 
I'll just get in the car with him and come over to Wabash. I said, won't have any trouble with him, won't have to fight him. And he said, okay, you want to do that? I said, well, I don't believe you'll do anything. So I got in the truck and we started to Wabash and he had a Model T. You remember they had two ears on him here and they, he pushed them both down, sparked in the gas. And this fast that old truck would come and we'd come to Wabash. <laughs> and we didn't get very far out of Manchester until he says, uh, no, he said, uh, you don't care if I sing, do you? And I said, no. So he began to sing religious songs, and he sung pretty loud. And we'd meet a car, and he'd say, now you see that car coming? I said, yeah. Well, he says, the Lord won't let us hit him. We'll miss him. <laughs> we come down to first the county farm out here, and we met a I didn't know at the time what the car was, but it was one of these big seven passenger Studebakers. Old touring cars, remember? But when it got up to us, I saw what it was, but at the time I saw it coming, it's coming down there, and it was coming for a good gait. It was a big car. And he said, now, you see that car coming there? I said, yeah. He says, I'm going to pull right up in front of him and stop. He says, the Lord won't let us hit him. I said, well, you don't know what the devil's going to do. Maybe the devil <laughs> changed his mind. <laughs> and Ali says, I'm going to do that. And cars kept coming, and he began to pull over in front of this other car. Well, I began to get it up my neck then. And so when we got up pretty close to him, I just twisted the key, shut the motor off, and we grabbed the wheel and we missed him about that fur. And I had the mace, I had a big heavy mace, and I had it up my sleeve. And I just let that mace slip out, and I said to him, I said, now you see that? He said, yeah. And he'd been to silent before, and I think they'd used a rubber hose on him a time or two. He knew what it was. I says, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. If you try that again before we get into town, I'm going to kill you and we'll both go to hell together. <laughs> 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 and he drove a nice right down to the jail. He was convinced at that point. Yeah. yeah. Didn't have no trouble with him until we got to the jail. And we went in and this car, of course, had three or four men following back behind about a block or so. He didn't know that or didn't pay attention to it anyhow. That was the sheriff. And we got down there and parked on the north side of the Main Street down there in front of the jail. We got out and walked in and I opened the back door and we just walked in the office and I said, gee, this is fine. And he'd been hollering and singing and preaching so loud that he couldn't hardly really talk anymore. He said, I'm awful dry. I'd like to have a drink of water. I said, well, it's just, just tough luck here. You, uh, ain't any water in here. We'll have to go back here. And I went back and opened the jail, the jail door, and he came back there. Oh, no, oh, no, I'm not going in there. <laughs> and, you know, they came in the jail and it only took eight of us to put him in jail <laughs> without knocking him out. We had him in there for oh, three or four days, locked him in a cell back there and had a toilet in there. And of course, there was, you've been in the jail, haven't you? Yes, sir. And those iron bunks back there. And he tore that bunk bed all up and he tore the stool all out. Had little chunks of that stool that he broke up. And he had a pipe, an inch pipe, about was about that long, that he shaved in there. And that's what he broke the stool up with. And uh, he took the bed rail that he got out of the bunk, knocked out all the 
window lights out of the jail that he could reach. So we called a doctor, went back there, and he whammed one of them chunks at us at the other. We had, I think, there was seven other people in jail at that time. They, they'd get where he could stick his arm out there and throw them pieces at him, and he'd throw them chunks at him. And they called my, called uh, Mrs. Smallwood, and she called the sheriff, and we went over there. Sheriff called the doctor. He came down. We couldn't get up to the jail in the cell door. He whammed them things at us, and he had that pipe, and we couldn't open the door and let him out. That pipe, that had been bad. So we got talking around there, and I finally called him a name, and I said, let's talk this over. Now you've had a lot of fun, let's talk this over. Shake, a shake hand, and I got up. He couldn't put the bar out through the, that pipe out through the bars, hit me with it. I said, let's just shake hands and be friends. He says, okay, and he run his hand out like that, and I just grabbed it, pulled it around that way, and he had it hooked in the bar, see. And out in come the doctor, and he pulled up his sleeve and gave him a big heavy shot of morphine, and I held him until he went, started down, I let loose of him, and he just fell down. Well, then we drug him over in another cell, took everything off of him, clothed him, everything. put him over there, kept him there until we took him to Indianapolis. So we got, before we left for Indianapolis, I had the doctor to come in and give him another pretty good shot. Jim drove, and me and I don't remember who else was in the back seat with this guy. No. And we put him in the middle and put a blanket over his lap, and he. This other fellow sat on one end and me on the other, so he couldn't get up and grab the sheriff driving. <laughs> we got down to Indianapolis, and Jim drove. He exceeded the speed limit all the way down there. He just drove like the devil down there. And just as we got, drove up in front of the, the office down there where we unloaded these fellows, why, he began to come too, so we just took a hold of him and let him in, one man on each side of him. And we had him strapped, we had straps on him so he couldn't swing his arm. We got inside and the man took care of the doctor, that took care of the office. They usually set him down there and pumped him on the knee and asked him a lot of questions. And the sheriff said, now, doctor, he said, this man's it's bad. He's tough. Oh, we've had a lot of that. Well, Jim says, he's tough. You better get some help here if you got him. So he finally called two fellows, and they come up there. And just about that time, this guy began to get him out of that morphine, and he began to get kind of restless. So the doctor says, take him away. So we slipped our straps off of him, and we glad to get rid of him. <laughs> and they wasn't gone, and I'd only just, oh, just about 10, 15 feet, and we heard the dangest noise out there in the hall he ever heard. <laughs> he had two of the officers down, and a couple others come in there, and they took him back, of course, and throwed him in solitary in cell. <laughs> so the sheriff said to him, said, what do you think now? You think he's tough? <laughs> <laughs> Did you feel so you earned your pay that day? Oh, gosh. Glad that is over. Probably every penny of it, too. Oh, yeah. Now, uh, from uh, the sheriff's office then, you went to the, uh, went with the police department. Yeah. 
and eventually to uh, assistant chief. Well, yeah. To Roman then to assistant chief. You see, the first first term that Showalter was there, he he was elected for four years, and then they they give him. Uh, an extra term there to make the election come out. Well, then <laughs> the next sheriff that went in, which was Smallwood, uh, down in the state house, they changed that again. And then mm -hmm. Small, or Homer went back in after Smallwood got out, and they mm -hmm. changed it back. So he had ten years there in, in two terms. Ten years and two terms. And uh, he only supposed to have eight. Yeah. And that's where I got three years with him because I. Okay. I didn't go to work for Homer until the 20th day of January in 32. Now you started with the uh, police department uh, as a uh, patrolman. Yeah. And uh, did you uh, mention that you worked uh, nights at that yeah. time? Yeah, I worked 17 years nights. How big a uh, police force was there? Well, we had uh, six patrolmen, the chief and assistant chief. You do most of your work on foot? Oh, yes. And they had no dodge touring car there and left it in the garage all the time and we'd go down and walk around the beat mm -hmm. and uh, they had the red light system, you remember that. Mm -hmm. In other words, when when there was a call for you, they'd turn those uh, lights on we'd and you'd call, uh, call in. And they'd send us where we wanted to go and yeah. of course if we had to go out of town any place, we'd have to go up and get the car. Yeah. Now, was there a uh, garage in the uh, in the uh, city hall at that time? Didn't you yeah, keep the right, car in the right uh, in the back end, yeah. right in the east end of the where the station is there now? They just well, the, the cars wasn't as large then as uh, now. Mm -hmm. After they got the building, the cars bigger, they wouldn't go in there anymore, mm -hmm. so they couldn't put it in there. Still no radio then no, the car in those no. in those days. Mm -hmm. What what would you do on your uh, your patrol downtown? You take the doors of the uh, business buildings and uh, well yeah and then they had uh, Bill Ply was what we call the, the door knocker mm -hmm. he'd go around see after the stores closed he'd try all the doors see that anybody didn't leave one open mm -hmm. and then all night he'd ever oh, so often he'd go around and when we'd go around we'd always throw our lights on the door to try them then uh, most of the time, while you were working at night, there would have been you and uh, one or two other men on duty. Yeah, we'd get one night a week off, and there was four of us. You see, there's uh, assistant chief, he worked nights, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then there was three patrolmen. Well, three nights, they'd be all of us on, mm -hmm. seven nights in a week. Mm -hmm. and the other time, there'd only be three of us. What were your major calls and problems then? Old fights. And once in a while to break in. Mm -hmm. One big trouble we had there at the bank corner. Remember, I expect you remember that this is Wabash Street and here's the bank corner right here. The uh, interurban tracks come up here and went down here to where the slogan trail is and okay, they, they, down there. That was the they, they came down the Wabash Street Hill. Is that right? Uh, the inner or the uh, streetcar tracks? Yeah. And turned west then on Market Street. No, that was the city. The, okay. Uh, the inner urbans come in from from Marion down mm -hmm. across the Wabash Street Bridge and the, and the other one come from Fort Wayne come down Water Street and up. Okay. And they turn right here. Well, there was a light pole or a telephone pole sitting right here, and they'd, when that inner urban turned, there'd only be about that much room between Just the, about a foot or a foot and a half. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, then here was, they had two-way traffic there. Here was a bunch of cars coming. They didn't know the inner urban was coming. And they'd stop here. Well, then this inner urban couldn't, couldn't turn without mashing those cars. Well, then here they are from Miami Street. And then the officer would have to get out there and get the start there over to Miami and back them all up. <laughs> so and that, they could get out. And that happened more than once, then, oh, I take it. Oh, yeah. Now, I'll tell you something else. There's only 12-hour days there. That's all we worked. Well, you took my next question, then. <laughs> what, what time would you come in? Six o'clock in the evening? Six to six. Six to six, yeah. Two, uh, two shifts of officers, then. Yeah. Uh, 
who else was on the department when you first came on? Well, let's see, on my trick, there was Walter Dye, Dale Spar, Vera Howe, that's three, I was four. And on the day trick, there was, uh, they were older men. Did you know Gizmail? Remember him? No, sir. Well, he was a little fella. He was on days. And Joe, uh, Harry Ridgway was chief. He worked days, of course. Joe Barrett, mm -hmm. Giz Nail, that would be three. Who was the other? Oh, uh, you know him too. He used to work at the uh, container down there, drove that big black team down there for years. He died down in the city park on duty. Driving a car. You think we could meet him? Yeah, you'd remember him. Yeah, maybe his name will come to you in a moment. Uh, so, uh, uh, if if the older fellows worked the uh, day, then the night uh, night duty must have been the uh, the trick that was not wanted. Oh yeah. They, and then after, they of course later on they changed the hours. They give us ten hour days, mm -hmm. and then finally got when I quit is giving us eight hour days. Do you, do you remember what you were paid when you uh, first became a policeman? One hundred dollars. Hundred dollars a month. Month. Twenty five dollars a week. And then the uh, depression come on. You're too young to remember that. They cut us twenty five dollars just overnight. We got seventy five dollars for one year. And then time began to look a little better and they give us a five dollar raise. And then they told us to get, donate that to charity people that was off duty. Yeah, right. So the city was paying us, made them look good, and then we had to give that $60 a year, you know, yeah, 5, 12, 60, $60 a year we had to give to, to charity. Now to whom was that paid then? Well, they just held it out on us. Mm -hmm. That I don't know who that is paid. Well, now you, uh, you worked uh, so many years, though, uh, on uh, night duty. Yeah. The, the assistant chief, you see, up until the last few years, the assistant chief worked nights, mm -hmm. and the day chief worked days. Mm -hmm. You were um, assistant chief then for how many years? From Seven, 17 years. 17 years as assistant chief. Yeah. Uh, does that know you were... Uh, as I recall, you were riding with uh, Clint Ostheimer the night uh, he was shot. When was that? Uh, that would have been in the early 40s sometime. Well, now, let's see. That must have been in 45, because it was under Homer Showalter, and he'd been just been elected, and I, mm -hmm. I think that happened in January, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. well, it happened in January, February, but I know it was one of those two months. And and uh, you think 1945? Yeah, 45. Yeah, it would be 1945. What are your recollections of that night? Well, last time and me was in the patrol car. We had privilege using the car after we was on there so long, but uh, and we was park headed east on Wabash Street there on the bank corner, the bank corner now. And uh, some fella came through there, a car, put it that way, a car came through there. And they didn't pay any attention to the traffic light, just went through there and just buzzed. So I was driving, I took out after him. We couldn't catch him. He wouldn't pay attention to the siren or anything. He just kept going. We chased him all over the 
north east part of town. I finally, between East and Spring Street, if you remember there, at, uh, going south on East Street towards the railroad there, that's down grade. And there's a hill. It was an awful stormy night, and that was slick as glass in there. Well, he cut a figure there, and we got in front of him, got him stopped. And the last time we jumped out of the car and got him out of the car. And I was parked on the south side of Maple Street, headed west. And Ostheimer brought him over and put him in the back seat behind me. And I figured that he'd searched him and everything. Of course, he'd been instructed that way. Just bad night and working too fast to get out of the cold. So I turned around and watched him. I had the light on in the car. I just sat there and watched him. And he didn't attempt to do anything. So last time I went over and got the key out of the car that he was driving and uh, turned the lights out run the windows up and whatever there was to do, and he came back and got in there and sat down the side of it. Well, there was two mistakes made there, on, I think, on account of the stormy night, because Alzheimer put him in the car and let him sit right behind the driver. That was a no-no. Mm -hmm. Then he come in, Ostheimer come in, and got in there and sat down the side of him, and we started for the, for the jailhouse. Well, this guy was pretty drunk. And uh, we got to the Wabash Railroad there on Wabash Street, and Ostheimer began to ask him some questions, and asked him where he got that car. And he said, over at Marion. Well, the uh, car didn't have Marion license on it. And he said, well, that car ain't from Marion, and wham, I heard a shot. I turned around there, said, lost time, and just reared back like that. He glanced around, and he had that gun pointed right at me. Well, I grabbed the gun driving with one hand, got my feet tangled up in the radio wires, and coming down the hill on that ice and snow. And when we got to where Gackenheimer used to be there on the alley, on the north or south side of the alley, you remember that, don't you? Mm -hmm. Between uh, between Hill Street and uh, Main Street then, on the uh, Wabash Street Hill. Yeah. yeah, and it's on the south side of the alley, mm -hmm. going east there. Why, this guy, Mosey Harold is his name, Mosey, opened the door and jumped out. And I lost the gun that I had a hold of, I was trying to keep the car in the, in the street. And, and I did sideswipe a couple of cars coming down there from Hill Street down to the alley. There's a couple of cars parked there and I hit them a little. Not bad, didn't damage them any, but I scraped him and I was trying to keep the car in the middle of the street. And he jumped out, and when he jumped out, he fell. I saw all that, and then I tried to straighten up and get the car stopped, and I put on the brakes and the car, of course, slipped on the pavement. Come down, if you remember, in the corner of the courthouse, there's a cedar tree sitting up here they planted up there. Up on the hill. Yeah, mm -hmm. up on the courthouse lawn. Mm -hmm. Well, I finally turned my, I didn't have any brakes on account of the ice. I turned the car so it would run up that hill towards that tree. Mm -hmm. Up, on, up uh, on the uh, hill on which the courthouse stands. Yeah. And I shut the motor off and left it in gear. I shut the motor off and put on the brakes there. I had the brakes on, I guess, but I set the brakes anyhow. And last time I was still back there. And 
I, I turned around and glanced, and this guy was just getting up over there at the alley. So I jumped out of the car and took after him. When I got to the alley, I saw him. Here's the alley, and he, he was turning right behind the buildings going north, up there where Pauline Barker now lives, mm -hmm. up that way. And I just saw one foot go past a telephone pole that was there. So I fired the gun there. And I ran up there as fast as I could. Of course, I didn't know if he had the gun or not. I kind of thought he was there. So I got up there and up here about 20 feet, he was getting up again. He fell down the second time there that, that I saw. That was the third time after he got out of the car. But, and so I was gaining on him. I took out after him, and I fired a couple of shots, not, not at him, because I wanted to catch him alive. I wanted him to talk. And uh, I kept gaining on him, and every little bit, about every 10, 20 feet, he'd stumble and go down again. I was gaining on him, and he got up to Hill Street and turned west on hill, and there in front of the, remember where the cleaners was? I guess, no, it ain't there yet. Still, still yeah. there. Mm -hmm. Well, Six. at the back end of that, at the east end of that, I caught up with him, and I stopped him right there. And he stumbled there, but he stumbled pretty hard. And uh, he went down, and time I got my breath and got squared around, I searched him for the gun, and I couldn't find it. So I suppose he'd lost it on the way up there. And that was a necessary thing to have, that gun. Because I'd fired mine. It could have been my gun that mm -hmm. killed off timer. Mm -hmm. But uh, I wanted that gun and I wanted it bad. Well, anyhow, I kicked snow on his face and washed his face with snow and finally got him up on his feet and drug him and walked him down to the police station. <clears throat> then we took him in there, and I turned him over to Reynolds. Reynolds was at the desk at that time, and uh, I couldn't even, coming down the hill there after I'd heard the shot, I couldn't even use the radio because I had one hand on the gun and one on the, the steering wheel, and I couldn't handle the radio, so Reynolds didn't know he was coming down there. He wasn't aware of what had no, uh, not taken like place. Not until after I brought him in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I turned him over to him, and I went back over to the car then. And Ostheimer had got out of this car and was laying on the tree lawn, on the tree lawn of the courthouse there on Main Street. And uh, the car had come down and sit around and